Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. Uh, my wife and I, Janelle, are um, very happy to be here. I love my kids dearly, but anytime I can get a get an evening away from them, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely welcome. And I can hear that chuckle. So there's a lot of there's a lot of parents out there too that understand that. So um, my story is uh, is a lot different, and it's hard to follow um, uh, a talk like that and a speech like that. And and that's 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 exactly. This is the exact turnaround. Everybody wants to hear about the veteran because if you look at me, you can look at that picture, you can tell something tragic happened in not just my life, but my family's lives. But my wife and my kids are so quickly overlooked and, and all of the uh, attention is drawn to me, which I don't, I don't really care for or want. Um, but uh, in, as Pat was kind of sum up, I chose to be explosive ordnance disposal. And if those of you don't know who that is, um, if you ever seen horrible movies like The Hurt Locker, um, or, or blown away uh, or whatnot. Similar movies like that, not as dramatic, not as cool. And in the Marine Corps, we don't have any money, so we have no tools and everything. We just have to, we have to blow everything up or work on it with our hands. And uh, so um, I, I, I started out in the aviation community, had a great time doing that. And uh, I understood what life at sea was like, and it was rough. And I knew I wanted to do more. I, didn't, I felt more like an airplane mechanic and not as much like a, uh, a guy that you know, was going to be you know, 200 pounds, caught a muscle, and had you know two machine guns on his chest, and running through, running through smoke and uh, gunfire. And uh, I signed up for EOD to do more of that and to, to contribute more and more. And my wife was really reluctant, and she, um, we were living around the Camp Lejeune area, Cherry Point, and uh, someone, an EOD tech, had just lost his life on the ranges of Camp Lejeune, and she was really reluctant. And uh, but she supported me. She said, "If, you, if that's what you, your heart says, we'll go." And we had uh, our, our oldest daughter, Caitlin, was with us. And we just moved and we just picked up, um, went down to Eglin Air Force Base, trained for nine months. It's the hardest, it's the hardest school in the military academically, not as much physically demanding, but academically. Nine months of training, classes every day, practical application, it is difficult because you're doing a difficult job on your own. I did two deployments to Iraq that were very successful, six months, uh, six month term, a lot of action in Iraq, in between Fallujah and Ramadi, we saw a lot of IEDs, disarmed a lot of, a lot of IEDs. Saved a lot of people's lives, I feel. Did a lot of difference in the community by having roads not as destroyed. Um, we built waterways and things like that, not just uh, worked on IEDs, but had a great time. Went to, got to teach for three years, and then uh, they said my time was up, you know, on my vacation at Eglin Air Force Base, and I had to go to Okinawa. I got to Okinawa in June of 2010. I got, to, I got there, I unpacked my stuff, kind of and then immediately came back to the States with my team. I was a platoon sergeant now, I was a gunnery sergeant, and I was in charge of taking 12 other guys, 12 other, 12 other Marines to get them trained to go into combat in October. I barely spent two, two months or maybe two weeks um, actually with my family on the island of Okinawa before I shipped out in October 2010. Uh, we did, a, a man, man and my partner did a lot of good stuff in, um, in Afghanistan, Marja area. And uh, then we got called up to go to Sangin. Sangin, Afghanistan has claimed a lot of lives and, and has made a lot of amputees in that area. We did a lot of good work. I was there for maybe two or three weeks. It was just so heavily saturated with IEDs um, that one day I, we just, I disarmed an IED in this hallway. I gave it to my partner to go destroy. I set up another explosive charge somewhere else. Three, two, one, we should have saw two bangs. Only one bang went off. My, my partner immediately realized he messed up. He was a younger guy, a new guy. He starts uh, uh, swearing and, and taking off after to fix his mistake. I don't know what's going on. Ultimately, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in charge of the whole situation. I take off running after him. I don't want my partner to get hurt. And um, I had no clue what was going on, so I'm running. And the only way this whole patrol has gotten through this danger area is because we stayed in each other's footprints, okay? And we cleared the area as best we could, but you just can't clear all of Afghanistan. It's impossible. And even if you do, as soon as you go to sleep, it'll be, it'll be covered with IEDs again. So he knew, my partner knew to play hopscotch through our footprints and get across this little land bridge, this little uh, log bridge and, and get back to safety. Uh, but I didn't. I didn't know if this, this 15 pounds of explosive that we uh, disarmed was going to blow up. So I had my rifle up on my, and I'm going through this hallway, and I'm not playing hopscotch. I'm just running after him, yelling his name. And I stepped on a device that we didn't see. Nobody caught, myself included, and it was my responsibility to clear that. And I stepped on one. Instantly, I can hear my ears. I remember vividly being thrown through the air, laying on my stomach. When I landed on my stomach, I kept my eyes closed because I was so paranoid about losing my vision and not being able to see my girls again. And I laid there on the ground, and I, my, my arms and legs were numb. I couldn't move anything. And uh, I called out for the doc sarcastically, oh, doc, you know, like, where the heck are you? You know, get over here. 
I'm not, I'm not walking out of this. And I knew things were bad then, but uh, as soon as they started, as soon as they uh, started applying tourniquets and morphine, everything was good. We, uh, after that, I was immediately rushed to uh, several helicopter rides. Were not able to sustain my life. I was so critical with uh, tourniquets on all four limbs. The uh, the helicopters couldn't fly 30 minutes, so they had to keep going to these little mash units, these little tents. If any of you watch mash, uh, these little tents in the middle of nowhere. These navy these navy doctors who worked their magic, pumped me full of blood. Sometimes the the wrong type of blood because they didn't have any more O negative. So they switched my whole blood type to O positive, which you can't you, you're not supposed to endure. Then back to O negative when I got back to the states. Uh, finally, I got to um, the main base in Afghanistan and then to uh, Longstool. When they thought I wasn't going to make it, they flew my wife. They were about to fly my wife into Longstool. I guess I'm too stubborn to die, and uh, I was able to make the long flight from Longstool to Bethesda. I remember landing in Bethesda. I was injured December 28th uh, in Afghanistan. January 2nd is when I got to Bethesda. And I remember the doors opening up on this big hospital, this mega, this mega ambulance on wheels, this mega hospital uh, on wheels, this ambulance. The doors open, I could feel the cold air on my face. Um, I had all these machines where my legs used to be. It was in and out of consciousness. And I remember, my, I remember smelling my wife. I remember her kissing me on my cheek. My family was there, and uh, it, it just made me feel good. Immediately from there, I was rushed into surgery and proceeded. I don't know the number while I was in Afghanistan, how many surgeries, how many operations, what happened there. But I know just to Bethesda alone, it was at least 65 surgeries, 65 different days some 12 hour days, some 10 hour days, all different variations that would just clean out the dead necrotic tissue or patch something back up or pump more blood into me just to try to stabilize me to get one more day. So to, so to put, put things in perspective, my wife's birthday is on February 3rd and she thinks I did this on purpose, uh, some sick joke or something, but uh, my, my lungs what, my lungs actually filled up with fluid. Uh, I had a collapsed lung on my left side. Two liters of fluid pulled out of, the, pulled out of my, cap, my lung cavity and uh, I flatlined, I died on her birthday. And uh, so a month later after I'm in the States, you know, we're still, it's still critical, it's still touch and go. And it was, it was hell on her. And it was, uh, my kids were in, in, in Fleming Island, my, my, uh, my in-laws became parents again. And so there was a lot of stress put on my wife, a lot of stress put on my family. I'm in La La Land, I thought I was, you know, I thought I was bicycling with Lance Armstrong because I happened to see him in Afghanistan before I left. You know, I'm, I'm out of it. I was speaking fluent Japanese to my mom and stuff and, and uh, uh, biting the nurses, you know, and, and doing sit-ups. It, it, was, it was nuts, the things that I was doing. It was out of character and because uh, all of the, all the morphine and the ketamine and, and the horse tranquilizers they were giving me to keep me, keep me sedated. So uh, when, when I finally started getting my head back, and uh, um, this is about March or April time frame when they were allowed, it would allow me to stay awake long enough because I, was, I wasn't violent enough to hurt anybody, including myself. They actually started, uh, I started talking to my wife and telling her what was going on, what my perspective was, and uh, she, she told me a story that I'll never forget. Uh, we'll rewind the clock to her, to her March, April time frame. She told me that my, my daughter's birthday, my oldest daughter, uh, who's very special to me, Caitlin, her, her birthday is January 21st, and uh, when I was in the hospital, when I was in the ICU, come, come uh, January 18th, I come hell or high water, you know, I'm going to see my daughter and all my daughters on her birthday, I, she has to be here, and I'm, and I'm, I'm adamant about that. My wife's like, honey, I don't have, we don't have the funds, you know what, what do you want me to do? I can't, I don't have a plane. And so, uh, next thing you know, maybe two phone calls were made, and boom, my kids were, my kids were in the hospital with me. And I never knew how that happened. I was, I was you know, too drugged up uh, to know what was going on anyway, but I knew that they were there. I remember that day. That was only the second time I'd ever seen my kids in the hospital. And if you can see, if you can think about it, maybe a week later, I flatlined and could have died and, and never seen my kids again. But at least I, I was able to see that. And that second time I saw my kids was solely responsible, uh, that was only possible by the Yellow Ribbon Fund. They paid for the plane tickets at the drop of a hat. I don't know how they did it because I could never get tickets that, that high uh, a priority, uh, especially for three, girl, or three girls and my, uh, my sister-in-law. They let them go in the cabin of the plane, sit in there touching buttons. I'm, you know, I don't know what they did. I may be, may be liable for that. They broke something. <laughs> and they let them sit in the cockpit, gave them wings, took pictures, all that stuff that you think would not happen after 9-11, but they let my kids do, treat them like royalty. And um, I remember seeing these photos after I was more conscious, and I was blown away that that kind of, that, that kind of, um, that, that kind of hospitality was out there, that kind of, that kind of love 
and appreciation was out there for me. I didn't get hurt and say, okay, you know, I'll pay up, here it comes, you know, you owe me something. No, I didn't do that. I served my country to fight for my country and that was it. And I understood this is part of the game and, I, and that, it, we all take that risk. But uh, to see Yellow Ribbon Fund and other organizations like them uh, put as much as they do, paying it forward and keeping their staff small at Walter Reed, keeping their, their they don't have commercials all over the place, sending people blankets for $100 donations. You get $80 worth of junk back in the mail. It, it, the, the emphasis is kept on the veteran. The emphasis is kept on the caregiver, on the families. And that's not like that. And there is a ton of, there's a ton of nonprofits, I'm sure you know, if you Google nonprofits for veterans. And I'm glad in a way that supporting veterans in this day and age is popular. Because I could not imagine coming back as a Vietnam veteran and being spit on in uniform. I would lose my friggin' mind. To sum it up, I, I, I'm grateful, very grateful to be here tonight. My wife is too. Um, and we're, we're so thankful to be, uh, to be allowed to know this, this organization, this Yellow Ribbon Fund. And the things that they've done, they just didn't do that one, that one thing. They constantly play, paid for it. They had an open tab at the Navy Lodge where my, my wife never had to worry about a bill. She never had to worry about cleaning her room, nothing. She always had a room within running distance of me if I needed her. They could call her and she would be running over there within the stone's throat. She never had to worry about anything as far as lodging, plane tickets, anything. My mom was able to come up several times. It wasn't just a one-time thing, but for a guy that was out of it, to have those things taken care of when I micromanage everything, I worried about all those details, is immense. And I can never say thank you enough. So uh, I, I thank you again and thanks for having me.